Andrew Yang. How does he feel he did tonight? You got Aaron Burnett, Dana Bash with Andrew Yang. How do you feel? I feel great. We feel like we hammered the core message, which is that we have to humanize this economy and make it work for the people and families right here in New Hampshire and around the country. And I've been campaigning here the last number of months, really, and too many families here in New Hampshire feel like it's not working for them and that they're getting left behind. That's what we need to change. I was watching you and wondering when or if you were going to get into the conversation when it turned to uh, the subject of race. Um, because now except present company excluded, it's a, it's a white stage. What did you think about how that conversation went and what would you have wanted, have wanted to add there that you can add here? Well, I did feel a bit of responsibility because I knew I was the lone candidate of color on the stage. Uh, and I responded to Elizabeth where I just don't think you can legislate away racism, um, that you need to actually try and balance these economic inequities that are unfortunately just huge, have been persisted for generations, and we know how to change them. I mean, if we have the, the popular will to say, look, we should just start e evening out the economy by putting money into people's hands, we could actually address many of the inequities in our communities of color. Uh, and that's what Dr. King championed in the 60s. That's what I'm championing right now. But you know, there was a moment when race, there were a couple of moments when race came up, but there was one moment that, you know, we were sitting there watching and it just, it felt slightly awkward because you had people up there talking about black voters in South Carolina and sort of kind of talking about, well, who did black voters like more? And you had a bunch of white people up there talking about black voters. Did you, did you notice that? Did that feel awkward to you that, you know, you're looking at a stage that, that, that in terms of that moment and that conversation was a bunch of white people talking about it? You know, I, I did miss uh, Corey and Kamala at that, mo <laughs> that moment. And I also did feel some degree of responsibility to make sure I, I, I hit the, really the, the core of the uh, issue is just that, look, black families have 10% the net worth of, of white families in this country, which ends up having this whole cascade of negative social impacts. And yes, putting money into people's hands does not alleviate structural racism in all of its forms and levels, but at least it pushes us in the right direction and provides a foundation or a floor that we can keep building on top of. Just kind of big picture, um, you campaigned really hard in Iowa. Uh, you well, thanks for noticing that. Didn't, you didn't, uh, <laughs> you didn't, fair to say, you didn't, uh, you know, come up the way that you thought you would. Why do you think New Hampshire will be different? New Hampshire has always been the most natural home for this campaign. Why? The, the, why? Why is that? Well, the people here are very, very independent minded. And the primary is actually a much better fit for us because you can have independents and libertarians even, and even Republicans vote in a way that they would not in a caucus in Iowa, that they can show up at any point Tuesday. And I've been joking, they're going to vote on Tuesday. And you know when we're going to be able to count the votes? <laughs> also Tuesday. So it's going to be great on that level, too. Uh, but New Hampshire has, has consistently been the state that we've been the strongest. So Tom Steyer was, there were a couple of moments he was, you know, so I think expressing himself pretty aggressively. He was angry about the economy, saying, look, we all need to focus on that. And that's what we need to defeat President Trump on. That was the point he was making. President Trump said at a State of the Union this week, jobs are booming, incomes are soaring, poverty is plummeting. I'm thrilled to report to you tonight that our economy is the best it has ever been. Okay. Um, his economic growth numbers this week were weaker than he wanted them to be, but unemployment it's pretty amazing. It's hard to argue that. It's near historic lows for group after group after group. Wages are growing. How do you make that argument to people that the economy is a problem for them right now as opposed to a strength? Well, if you remember Donald Trump when he was running for president four years ago, he said that the headline unemployment number was fake news because it masks the fact that millions of Americans have dropped out of the workforce and stopped looking. He was actually right four years ago, the labor force participation rate has fallen to 63%, close to a multi-decade low in the same levels as Costa Rica and El Salvador, as some international comparisons that you do not want if you're in the United States. So the headline unemployment number is masking a ton of weakness. It's also masking underemployment. It's masking the fact that 40 to 44% of recent- to, People forced to work part-time and stuff like that? Yeah, because you, you still show, like if you're an underemployed college graduate who's a barista, check employed. If you're doing two jobs because you can't make ends meet with the one job, check uh, employed. 94% of the new jobs that are getting created are temp gig or contract jobs that don't have a meaningful path forward, can disappear at any moment. 
And financial insecurity is still as high as it's ever been, where 78% of Americans say they're living paycheck to paycheck, half say they can't afford an unexpected $500 bill. So there's a lot of structural weakness uh, that's not showing up in some of the numbers the president is citing. It, you, you made a joke about the fact that New Hampshire is going to actually vote on Tuesday, and you'll see the votes on Tuesday. Uh, but in all seriousness, especially as somebody who comes from the business world and about you know know and understand organization, how concerned are you about the stain that would happen in, in Iowa will leave on the Democratic Party and the ability to lead, the ability to you know, get it together, to, to win, never mind govern? I think it's much harder to make the argument that we can manage very complex systems if we can't count votes the same night in a way that's so you think it hurts your party? Effective. I think it's bad for the Democratic Party. I think it's bad for the country. And you can't look at it any other way where it just is yet another way to diminish public trust that we can get things right in a way that will serve the public interest. It's something that never should have happened. And as someone who's run organizations, like I can see how it happened and it was completely preventable. All right, thank you very much, Andrew Yang. Thanks all. Thank you. Are all y'all paying attention? Automation gonna sweep the nation unless we get him in. Andrew Yang, 2020 Freedom Dividend. Climate change is real again. Science rules.